Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Matthew Burns, and I'm here to today excuse me, to talk to you about the Canadian Parents for French uh, Retirement Savings Plan. So basically, I wanted to go through a few pieces of information to highlight for you and for the plan um, to allow you to better maximize this plan going forward and to ensure that uh, the use of it is, is fully, fully taken advantage of. Okay? So before we go forward, I will just, if it's not freezing, sorry about this. My, oh, there we go. Apologies. All right. So just a quick plan overview, or, or an agenda overview, excuse me. So first I'm going to talk about the plan, uh, the assets and the different fund types. I uh, then want to spend a bit of time talking about why we invest in an overview of the market, uh, followed up by online features. So everybody in this plan has access to the group retirement savings plan uh, website. It's called GRS Access. There's lots of neat features that you can go through that I, I certainly want to highlight for you. And then last but not least, how to take this plan and leverage it, leverage it into a retirement income stream uh, further on down the line. Okay. So before we start, uh, I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about different fund types. So we'll talk about different risks, uh, different risk types, different um, equity versus fixed income and all that kind of stuff. And just to ensure that everybody's on the same page, I figured I'd take a few minutes to just outline what's available in this plan as of right now. So at the top of the list, there's something called target risk funds. So a target risk fund, in essence, allows the user to, speak, to pick a specific type of investment with a specific risk level and ensure that it's always maintained. Uh, as an example, let's say, say that I uh, go down to the local 7-Eleven and I, I get a scratch card and I, I win $10,000. Lucky me. Uh, so what I do is I go to invest it and I speak to my financial advisor and he or she typically asks, well, how risky are you or how risky do you want to be? And when people mention that, really what they're saying on the high level is, how much bonds versus how much stock do you want to hold in your investment? So on the, in, in general, the more bonds you have, the more conservative, and the more stocks you have, the more aggressive. So if I tell this person, look, I'm 50-50, I'm, I'm middle of the road, so he or she could take 5,000 of my dollars, put it in a stock fund, and 5,000 of my dollars and put it in a bond fund. And there's my 50-50 mix. But for all intents and purposes, that 50-50 split will never be maintained because you have two independent funds and two independent markets that move independent of each other. So for example, the stock market could shoot up and then I would become riskier than the 50-50 split I wanted or the stock market could go down and I would become more conservative. So in this instance, I would be responsible for going in and managing and rebalancing my investments on an ongoing basis to ensure 50-50 mix is split. So what a lot of these insurance companies and investment uh, companies realized a long time ago is that not a lot of people want to do that. They want to pick a set of funds or, or pick an investment, excuse me, with a set uh, breakdown of bonds versus stock to ensure that uh, that mit risk uh, level is always maintained. And basically what we have is the target risk funds as a result. So basically what that means is you can pick a target risk fund with anywhere from a conservative breakdown to an aggressive breakdown and, the, and uh, you can rest assured that no matter what's going on in the international markets your risk level will be, will be maintained. So if you have a, the conservative version which is 70 percent bonds, 30 percent stock, you know that no matter what happens they always rebalance to, to keep you at that 70-30 split. Uh, importantly here, these funds tend to do quite well against their, their counterparts and the reason for that is they're always efficient with your money. And what I mean, mean by that is let's imagine that the bond market shoots up, they're going to be selling bonds when the value is high. If the bond market goes down, they're going to be buying bonds when the market is low or the cost is low. So the old Wall Street, Gordon Gecko, buy low, sell high is always maintained. So in general, these are my favorite types of funds. They have a good um, selection for virtually any type of investor. And, and like I said a little while ago, they do perform quite well. Next on the list is target date funds. So a target date fund is a fund that um, is even more hands-off than, than a target risk fund. So what a target date fund says is, you pick your retirement date. So my retirement date, I'll be in my mid-60s in 2045. So what I would say is my retirement date is 2045, and what would happen is my um, 
my investment mix, my bond versus stock ratio would be updated as I get older to account for the fact that the general rule of thumb is you want to be more conservative when you're older because you don't have the time to make up the fluctuations or the big swings you see in a more aggressive investment. So this takes the traditional investment theory of aggressive young, conservative old, and manages that throughout your work life. So you basically pick a date and you don't really have to go back and do too much thinking about it. These are good funds. The only issue I have with them is they don't allow for much personalization. So I'm 37. I've met people that make me seem like a grandfather and they are exceptionally conservative and I've met uh, little old ladies that are uh, riverboat gamblers for lack of a better word. So not everybody wants to follow the old aggressive young conservative older um, idea. So if that doesn't fit your investment style the target date fund excuse me is not for you. Uh, balanced funds are very similar to target risk funds. The main difference here is the target risk fund has a very strict um, ratio requirement. So if it's 70-30 bond to stock, it will always be 70-30. Balanced funds are, again, a combination of bonds and stocks, the difference being they're not as rigid on the ratio between how much bond and how much stock you need to have. So in, at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're leveraging the expertise of the uh, of the specialist or the group that's, that's uh, managing this portfolio. Uh, and, and, and in essence taking, taking advantage of their skills and their background. So for example, if they think the bond market's going to shoot up, they'll move more over to bonds and vice versa. The risk here is um, there is potential obviously that the investment specialist, they're wrong. So there is a little bit riskier than target, target risk funds, but in general these are, are great funds that have a long uh, standing return history and, and, and tend to do quite well. Equity funds, so equity is just a fancy word for stock. So basically any type of stock funds you want is available anywhere from straight Canada to straight US to a sampling of US and or international. And then special equity, which would be your um, precious metals, uh, resource or, or industry specific type investment. Fixed income would be your bond type investments or mortgage type investments. Cash and cash equivalents are basically savings accounts and then last but not least ethical and socially responsible funds these are funds that have um, or only invest in companies and governments that have uh, ethical and socially responsible mandates so the cigarette companies and diamond mines that are going into indigenous villages and just kind of pulling them apart they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't be available to invest in um, they do return well but unfortunately it's a symptom of our times that less choice means less return so because they have a, a limited choice of funds that they can in, or investments mutual funds companies that they can invest in uh, they tend to perform slightly below their other similar funds that have uh, do not have I should say this ethical or socially responsible mandate okay so the next thing I want to do is I want to highlight the assets in the plan so this is the sum total of every investment that people are choosing there are a few things I do want to highlight here. So basically what we have is the daily interest account. And the daily interest account is not a place for long-term investing. It's, it's basically a savings account where you average about a quarter of a percent a year. One-year compound interest account. So historically these are good investments. So what they are is it's what would be comparable to a guaranteed investment certificate at the bank where you give, give Great West Life a certain dollar amount and they uh, guarantee you a, a percentage return based on interest rates. The problem is interest rates right now are exceptionally low, so this fund is not returning very well. Um, last but not least, we have the money market, which again is, is basically a, a savings account that averages about a percent over time. So because the plan here is designed to be long term uh, for some people 20, 30 years, um, by putting your money in these these investments you're losing a lot of opportunity so I'll highlight how in, on the next slide so what we have here are the returns um, and I apologize uh, this uh, this should say one uh, one year rate of return three year rate of return five year rate of return and then ten year rate of return so f one year rate of return is the one in the middle three-year rate of return is the second from the left, five-year rate of return is third from the left, and so on. 
So if we look at the very far right column, that's the 10-year rate of return. So if we compare, for example, a, um, a bond fund, which is relatively low risk, its 10-year rate of return is about 4.9%, which means in 10 years it's averaged 4.88% per year, or roughly 50% over the last 10-year time frame. If you compare that to the daily interest or money market or one-year compound interest, which are getting you about 1%, so this fund, the, the core bond, which is, again, quite conservative, got you close to 50%, whereas the daily interest account would get you close to 5 and the money market would get you about 10 So really what, what I'm trying to show here is there are good options to invest in that do not, uh, that have nice conservative mandates. Uh, but will allow you a much better return. So just going back one slide, if you're somebody who's in any of these three funds, please let me know as soon as possible because I think that there's some way there's a way, several ways to, to generate better returns for you. Okay? Uh, and I want to talk now sort of about the market and why we invest. So the first slide here, is why we invest in pre-tax plans in the first place. So the first thing I did is I put together a, a fake scenario. So we have somebody who makes $50,000 and his or her average tax rate, let's call it 31.15. And their monthly paycheck, uh, or they get paid, excuse me, once a month just to illustrate a little easier. So what that means is if this person um, makes no contribution to any RRSP or savings plan, their gross or pre-tax take-home pay is $4,167 and their net or after-tax take-home pay is $3,410. So again, if this person makes no monthly contribution, he or she has $3,410 with which to, to live and, and, and pay the bills, all that kind of stuff. So what I did here is I put together a slide with a few... Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, different contribution percentages. And I'll only really spend time looking at 5%. Uh, what we have here at 5% is, is, is a, a fairly typical contribution that somebody would make. So it's important to note that that 5% is the, is, comes off, excuse me, pre-tax. So really what that means, it's 5% of $50,000, which works out to be $208 a month. So this $208, again, is before tax is paid. So that 208 comes off the $4,166 we saw a little while ago, meaning that this person's taxable salary is now $3,958. When you apply the tax rate of 31.15%, this person takes home an after-tax salary of $3,239. When you compare that to the 3410 they were taking home before doing any contributions, you can see that their salary is actually only being reduced by $170, but they're putting $208 in the plan. So we're all smart people, so we will think about this for a little while, and, and I mean it's clear that, or, or just to be clear, I should say, this $38 is not magically appearing out of thin air. What it is is the tax that you're avoiding or deferring paying. But the value here, or the real important point to note is, this extra $38 is going to be growing and compounding over time, meaning you'll have a bigger pot uh, with which to retire. And really, when you do retire, 99 times out of 100, you're going to have a lower tax bracket anyway. So what you're getting is more growth at a reduced tax bracket, uh, or more, more growth, reduced cost. So again, this is the real underpinning reason for group retirement savings plans. If this didn't maintain, then, then there would be no point, but thankfully it does. So there is a lot of value that you can you can squeeze out of it. Um, okay, so now just again to talk about the markets in general. So let's go back to 1996, and I'm 17 years old, and again I go to Max Milk and I, I win another $10,000. Lucky me! And in a flash of inspiration, I say, you know what? I'm not going to go spend this on a car or whatever. I'm going to put this in the market and invest it. So I put it in something called the S&P 500, which is the Standard & Poor's Top 500 Performing U.S.-based Stocks. So you can actually invest in that. So I put my money in the S&P 500, and then I walk away. I forget. My, my, my flash of responsibility is gone, and, and I forget that I have the $10,000. Now, we fast forward 20 years later. Uh, my wife is pregnant, and I'm buying a car, buying a house, excuse me. So I, I go, oh, man, I better, I better revisit my finances and make sure that I, I have enough money. 
Well, going through it, I find a piece of paper that says, I got this, this investment I made 20 years ago. So without doing anything, without even thinking about it, over the last 20 years, my $10,000 would have grown by 382% and uh, would have yielded me a total of $48,234. That's without doing anything. Now, there's a few things to note here. First of all, I don't care how irresponsible or how forgetful you are. Nobody, nobody doesn't remember that they invested $10,000. So not only would I have been managing this over time, I would have created a, a, a less risky portfolio as I got older, so the big dips would have been less pronounced. And on top of that, about two-thirds of the way through this exercise, the investment that I chose dropped by 42%, or excuse me, 38% in the 2008 market crash. So I lost almost half my money about two-thirds of the way through this exercise. But despite all of that, I still almost quadrupled my money. So this just goes to show you that you put your money in the markets, you will get a return, especially when you have a long time to do so. But again, I wanted to say that it doesn't necessarily have to be the S&P 500. You can take something a little more conservative and still generate positive returns. So what we have here is from 2006 to 2015, we have the S&P 500 returns, and you can see the 2008 crash here where it was down about 38%. And then you have the Barclays Bond Fund, which is a nice conservative fund that kind of chugs away. Over that 10-year time frame, the S&P 500 got over 100% return overall. The Barclays Fund got just about 56. So obviously, 102 is better than 56. But, uh, but of course, this is done with hindsight. What I'm trying to show here is it doesn't matter if you're aggressive, which the S&P 500 is, or you're conservative, which the Bond Fund is. Over time, you will generate positive returns, which is why you should avoid those interest rate funds that I spoke to you all about um, shortly, uh, a short while ago. Okay? So those previous slides were aspects of the plan that were specific to investing in general. But I also wanted to, to talk about value, the value of this plan to you as individual members of the Canadian Parents for French plan. So what we have is... Uh, or what, what I want to show you here is, in essence, how these investments are paid for. So on the group side, or on the individual side, excuse me, there's something called an IMF, or an MER. Sorry, I'm getting them, my, my acronyms confused. On the individual side, every mutual fund investment has an MER associated with it. What an MER stands for is Management Expense Ratio. And really what it does is it's, it's a percentage cost to, to, to choose that, that particular fund. So if, for example, I was to go to somebody in the plan or somebody who does individual investing, excuse me, and they say, how did I do last year, Matt? Uh, well, and I say, okay, you had a pretty good year. You got 7% overall. And, uh, and I say <clears throat> the MER or the, the percentage fee for this fund is 2.5%, let's say. So if I tell this individual that he or she got a 7% return and the MER or the fee associated with this fund is 2.5%, typically what that means is they got about a 9.5% return and then the fund company takes that 2.5% off the top as their, as their cost, netting out as a 7% return. So if, for example, the fund company, instead of taking 2.5% only charged you 1.5%, then your overall return would be eight as opposed to seven because they're taking less off as their cost or their, their fee, excuse me. So what I'm showing here is individual funds right here and the, the associated investment fee. And then what we have on the uh, in the middle is group fees. So because you're in a group plan, they give you substantial discounts on the investment fee, which means you have the potential for better returns. So what I looked at was the average over time, and I can see that the difference is 0.59%. So on average, the investment fee is about 0.59% reduced in the group plan as compared to the individual, as to compared to an individual plan of similar type. And really what that means is when you invest, you're in essence guaranteeing yourself 0.59% more of a return over time because the investment firms are taking less off the top of the overall return, netting you out at a, at a higher number. So what I did again is I said, well, what does that mean for people? So I said, if we run the same $10,000 investment through the S&P 500, but we do it at a rate of 
5.9% less, we can see that over the same 20 year time frame, this person's going to have close to 12% more money, 12% more, uh, more assets. So really what, what you're seeing is the ability to take advantage of the, the economies of scale in this plan to generate better returns at no additional risk. Again, because the additional returns are purely being generated by reduced fees, not by, by any more risky type investment. Okay? Um, I do want to spend a few minutes now doing some stuff online uh, or, or talking about the online features. So like I said uh, at the outset, everybody who's in the plan has online access. If you don't have it, give me a call and I can tell you what you need to do to go about doing it. But uh, but again, just to over, oh, outline excuse me, a couple of the values of these types of features. So I've been talking a lot about risk and assets and all these different choices you can make and, and a lot of people say well I don't know how risky I am or I don't know what type of equity I'm interested in so first of all you can take a questionnaire it lets you know roughly what type of risk you're comfortable with whether it's uh, conservative or moderate or, or anything in between um, it's important to note as well that this is not set in stone so if it tells you you're a conservative investor but you actually want to be a bit aggressive that's totally fine. Really what it does is it gives you a starting off point to start thinking about this. You can also look at your investments. So what type of investments, you can look at the reports and the reviews of each individual mutual fund. And then of course, most people don't really care where the money is, they just care how it's doing. So you can see the rates of return as well. So how you've done over the last several years. Um, additionally, you can change your investments. So as you're getting older or if you, your life changes or for whatever reason you want to be more conservative or more aggressive, you can go online and you can change not only what you have, but the ongoing contributions going forward. You can also get some, some tools or some educational materials. So um, talking a lot about risk and volatility or fees and, and you have a little bit of, you want a little bit more uh, understanding on how those types of things work. You can log in, you can watch some videos, read some articles, do that kind of stuff. You can also plan your retirement. So what that does is it tells you, uh, or you tell the software, excuse me, roughly when you want to retire and how much you think you're going to need when you do. And what it does is it tracks your progress over time. So every five months, six months, whatever, you log in and you say, well, am I on pace with my, um, with my uh, retirement goal? Hopefully you are. Uh, if you aren't, um, then there's just some tools to get back on track. And, and in my opinion, the best one to get back on track is this one called, it's called the 1% Advantage. And what it is, is it allows you to show what small changes in your contributions, how they affect you long term. So in this case, I said, let's just pretend uh, I made up a person. So he or she, again, makes $50,000 and they're 32 years old and they're going to retire at 65. So currently he or she is contributing 4%. And I said, well, what happens if this person changes their investment from 4% up by 1%? So what I see here is the net effect is my take home pay is reduced by $31. So I now know that my monthly salary will be reduced by $31 so I can understand the impact on my budget. But on the right hand side, before the change was made, um, this individual was um, getting approximately 600 of estimated monthly income at retirement, but a 1% change or a $31 effect on his or her salary results in a new estimated amount of $750. So we're looking at a 25% increase by making a 1% change in, in contributions. So again, this is a great tool to get you back on track to ensure that um, uh, that you're going to be where you want to be when you retire. Which of course takes us to how you take what you have and leverage it as a retirement plan. So currently what you have is an RRSP. So when you leave the plan, this RRSP, oh, excuse me, this RRSP uh, moves to an individual RRSP. So it goes from group to individual RRSP. That's an investment vehicle pretty much identical to what's happening with the group plan. When you want to turn it into an income stream, which you'll have to at age 71, and I'll explain that in a second, you have two main options. You can put it into what's called a RIF or an annuity. So we'll start again with the RSP and the rules associated with it. So money can be invested on a tax-deferred basis in an RSP until the year you turn 71. It's not the day you turn 71, it's by the end of that year, so December 31st of whatever year you turn 71. 
At that point, the, the CRA, the government, requires you to start taking income. There's a, a very specific formula, and the rationale for age 71 is they've given whoever such a, a very long time to defer taxes. They, they, being the government, want to ensure that they start generating tax revenue at some point. So like I said, before 71, you can keep the money in an RRSP. You can also access money in an RRSP at any time. So if you need a couple bucks, you can pull it out of that, pay your tax, and, and it's no problem. But when you want steady monthly income out of it, there, like I said, there's two main ways. There's a RIF and an annuity. So I'll start with a RIF. So this is an income policy derived from an RRSP. It's still invested in the market, so it still has growth. Uh, there is a minimum percentage based upon your age. So like I said, you, don't, you have to do this at age 71, but you don't have to start. You can start sooner than that. So for example, if somebody was to start at age 65, there's a minimum of 4% that they have to take out. At age 71, there's 5.28%. Now there's no maximum here. Um, so if 4% is not enough and you want 8% or 12%, whatever you want, you can do that. As long as you take out the 4% in a given year, at age 65, of course, uh, you're on side and, uh, and there's, no, there's no problem. Now, again, this is a little different from your plan, but I always want to bring this up in every, uh, every plan that I talk about, is liras and lifts. So a lira comes from a pension plan, and a lif is the income portion of a lira. So the lira still has the age 71 rule. So if you have a lira, if you have a pension, and you left a company, and you now have a, a lira somewhere, a locked-in retirement account, when you turn 71 or before, you have to turn that into a lif. Um, the difference between a lira and a lif, or a lif, excuse me, and a rif, which comes from an RRSP, and I, I apologize for the acronyms, but this is an important concept, is a rif, like I said, has no maximum. A lif does. So at age 65, the maximum, the minimum, excuse me, is 4%. That's the same for both a rif and a lif. A rif has no maximum. A lif has a maximum, and it's about 7% at age 65. So let's just pretend that you have $100,000 and you're 65 and you retire. So if this is a RIF, your minimum is 4% or $4,000 and your maximum is however, however much you want in a given year. If the money is a lira, it goes into a LIF, your, max, your minimum is still 4%, but your maximum is 7%. So that means you basically have a window of four to $7,000 with which to retire or to plan your retirement for that year, which really isn't very flexible. So what the government said is they, they do this to make sure that people don't, in essence, spend all of their retirement money right at the beginning. They want to protect people a little bit. But they also realize that the flexibility that or the lack of flexibility is an issue. So what they've done is they give people, and again, I apologize for the acronyms, a one-time option to unlock half of the money that would have gone into a LIF and place it in a RIF. That might not seem like much, but if you think about it, if this person went directly to a lift with $100,000, their wiggle room is $4,000 to $7,000. Now, if they were to unlock it and take $50,000 in a RIF and $50,000 in a lift, they still have the same minimum of $4,000, but because the RIF portion has no maximum, they've now moved from a window of four to $7,000 to a window of four to about $53,000. So it really just creates more planning opportunity. There's no cost. There's really no downside. And also, there's not a lot of understanding about this feature that the CRA allows. So although it doesn't particularly pertain to this plan, I always want to bring it up because, like I said, um, it's very important, and if you don't do it within 60 days of going from lira to lif, the government um, the government says you're you're out of luck. It's too it's too bad. So um, that's that. And and again, a little off script here, but again, I, I just like to highlight that because, like I said, not too many people are aware of that feature. Uh, and then last but not least, you have annuities. So annuities are pretty much this excuse me, does satisfy the age 71 rule as well. Annuities operate like a reverse life insurance contract. So if you think about it, life insurance, you pay monthly premiums, you pass away, there's a lump sum to your estate. In this case, you pay a lump sum at the outset, and they guarantee you a monthly income for as long as you live. So if you live to be 150 and they promise you $1,000 a month, you're going to get $1,000 a month until you're 150. The issue with annuities is the main in, the main inputs? Excuse me, are interest rate, age, money, and gender. So 
Interest rates are at the bottom of the barrel right now, or pretty close, so annuity payouts are quite low historically right now as well. Hopefully when everybody retires, this is a much more viable option, but again, because of the payout that annuities are promising right now, they're not, uh, they're, they're not the best vehicle. Um, and of course, once you purchase the annuity, the money is gone. So if you trade your $100,000 in for a monthly income, you no longer have $100,000 as an asset. It's, it's no longer part of your balance sheet. Okay, so that's pretty much it. I figured I'd leave my contact details here. Um, I'm available whenever. If you have any questions, please give me a call uh, or shoot me an email, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope you all have a great day. Now I just need to figure out how to stop this thing. If I can.